The Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. Books so good, you'll wish you could read them again for the first time. Oh, that was pure genius. You know, I'm always a bit sad when I finish reading a really good book. It can be really hard to admit that it's kind of all over now and you have to move on and go your separate ways. Yeah, that's all very true, but you're forgetting what happens next. I think I must be, but what do you mean, Jude? Sagacious wife of mine. Well, you tell me, Richard, my son and stars. When you've read a really good book, what's the first thing you want to do? Ah, I can see where this is going. The first thing I want to do when I've read a great book is find somebody else who's read it or make you read it so we can talk about it. Which links us very nicely into the next book in our summer collection. I Am Pilgrim by Terry Hayes. I mean, I haven't read a thriller with possibly a stronger opener than this, this body in the acid bath. Mm, pretty horrible, isn't it? It's horrible. It's extremely um, <laughs> dauntingly written. Um, and it actually sets, sets the story up, because that's where we meet Pilgrim, this ex-CIA guy. Codenamed. His, okay. That's his codename, and we don't know everything about him mm. in his files and everything has been redacted. Mm -hmm. Everything's been struck out. So he really is this mysterious figure who we come to know through the story. And mm. I think that's very cleverly done, because unlike a lot of these sort of action guys, you know, with, a, with a, a rich CIA past and all the rest of it, actually, Pilgrim's quite a nice guy. Mm. He's actually quite funny. Mm. Um, he's, there's, there's one line in the book, he talks about... Um, he talks about... This is a, a lovely bittersweet joke. Try this one about Jeddah. He says, if you wanted to commit suicide and couldn't quite find the courage, two days in Jeddah would do the trick. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very unfair on Jeddah, but it's a funny joke. And yeah. there's lots of, lots of wry, bittersweet humour like that, isn't there? And basically the whole point is that he's tracked down this anonymous, codenamed guy mm. called Pilgrim. Mm. He's tracked down because he's written uh, an absolutely uh, essential, the best ever guide to forensic... Absolutely. Um, ...examination exactly. after a killing. And the point about the, the, the body in the acid bath is that all identification has been burned away. Everything's gone. Mm. Teeth gone, everything. Fingerprints, the lot, you know, it's so really So the guy who's investigating it mm -hmm. feels that the only way he can find out more about what's happened Calling is Pilgrim. to find Pilgrim. It's a job for Pilgrim. Identify yourself, the Marine signalman repeated. My name is Scott, but I knew that was the wrong thing to say. A name would mean nothing. Standing in the pounding sun, my eyes aching, I felt myself drift from my body. As if from on high, I looked down on myself. I can only just hear, the signalman said. Repeat, please. I barely registered it. I was watching the old bull wield the stonemason's hammer and I heard someone screaming in my head. I realised it was my own voice, but the only sound on the beach was the engine of the approaching boat and the scattered gulls circling overhead. I mean, the scope of the novel is wonderful, the sweep and scale of it. Um, we're in a beheading in the Middle East, uh, where we, we see terrible scenes in various hot spots around the planet, all leading to potentially Apocalypse. And we realise, as the book unfolds, that Pilgrim is actually chasing down what may be the end of the world, as we know it, mm. and has to stop that happening. Mm. And it, in a sense, it's ridiculous, but he draws you into it and uh, you believe it. Pilgrim, I managed to say. At least I thought I said it, but I couldn't be sure. Maybe it was just in my mind. I couldn't catch that. Repeat. Silence. I was watching a little boy with Down syndrome run along the sand and jump into his father's arms. Are you there? Say again, please. The signalman's voice dragged me back. I am Pilgrim, I said. No, it's a great book, and he's very famous, isn't he, himself? I mean, he's a very famous screenwriter. Yes, he is, he's yeah. spent his life uh, involved, deeply involved in screenwriting for oh, yeah. major American productions like uh, Dead Calm. Absolutely, yep. Yeah, he's got big experience on this. Well, look, much like the main character in I Am Pilgrim, uh, Terry's in more exotic climes as we speak, but by taking a leaf out of his hero's book, and with a little bit of ingenuity, uh, we made the most of modern technology and we linked up with him. Well, Terry, this is your first novel after a long and extremely successful writing career in newspapers, broadcast current affairs, and screenwriting for major Hollywood films. So. You've had a big deal of a career, really. So why a book? Um, because I think Hollywood has changed so much. Um, screenwriting in Hollywood isn't what it was 10 years ago, let alone 20 or 30 years ago. It depends less on narrative now and much more on spectacle. Um, and that, that I, I'm not being critical of Hollywood movies. Um, they're always in a state of flux, always in a state of evolution. Um, but if you're... 
if you've grown up and you're interested in a, a strong narrative structure, if you really believe in storytelling and taking an audience on a terrific emotional journey rather than doing a lot of explosions, um, then I, I, it becomes a more and more frustrating place to work. That's not to say that there aren't, you know, Hollywood movies that are still, you know, great stories, but the audience tends to be much younger, uh, with perhaps a shorter attention span. And so you see that, you know, movies like The Avengers uh, are doing huge business, whereas something like Zero Dark Thirty does not do that level of business. So I'm a storyteller. Um, that's what I've always been, always what I've always wanted to be. And I figured the best format for telling stories is a novel. It just took me a long time to get around to doing it. And how challenging was it to write a novel rather than a script? How much crossover in, in style and concept is there? Um, all writing's challenging. Well, it, it is for me. Maybe it isn't for other people. Um, you know, um, Red Smith, who is a, a great writer, sports writer for the New York Times, he said, oh, writing's easy. He said, I don't understand why all these people get so, you know, precious about it. He said, what you do is you sit down in those days in front of a typewriter and you sit there and you stare at the blank piece of paper and sooner or later beads of blood appear on your forehead. He said, then you can start to type. Um, I know what he means. It's always beads of blood. Uh, whether it's a screenplay, whether it's a major feature article for a newspaper, whether it's a novel, whether it's a TV miniseries, it's always tough. You're always looking for clarity, for that great turn of phrase, all of those things. So I didn't find writing a novel any more difficult than writing a screenplay. I certainly didn't find any less difficult. Um, so it it was a liberating experience because most screenplays are 100 and, you know, 20 to 130 pages. And uh, it was pretty open-ended with what I could write uh, as far as the novel was concerned. So I felt a freedom in that regard. But you don't have, you know, fantastic special effects. You don't have wonderful uh, composer for the music. You don't, don't have great actors. You don't have the editing room. You don't have a lot of things that can salvage you when you're doing a movie. All you've got is your thoughts and what ends up on that page. So that was a bit of a confronting thing. The other thing is, and it's related to that, when you're making a movie, there's always somebody else to blame. You can always... You know, when you're sitting there in the theatre and people are booing, you can always sort of say, if you're the writer, well, it wasn't really my fault. The director wasn't very good or we should never have cast that person. There's plenty of places to hide. With a novel, there's nowhere to hide. It's just you and the reader. So every time I thought of that, I sort of got a bit paralysed. Um, but I managed to, you know, find my way through it. As far as crossover in style, it, it's always really just storytelling. You're always looking for that better way to do something. And the end result of that is to try to make it as emotional as possible. Uh, I think when you're writing a screenplay, you're trying to imagine every moment up on the screen and trying to get that audience dragged up onto the screen, try to involve them in it. When you're writing a book, you try to drag the audience into the pages. So to that extent, there was no difference. It was, you need better turn of phrase, better prose, you need greater clarity in writing a novel. But those were things that I was aware of. And so I disciplined myself to try to do that. How successfully? Well, I don't know. That's up to other people to judge. Now, interestingly, you quote both John le Carre and Raymond Chandler at the beginning of this book, so I'm guessing that they must have been significant influences on you. Um, yeah, yeah, they, um, they cross the waterfront, that's for sure. I mean, you're at either end of the spectrum. You know, you've got a very elegant, very sophisticated, uh, you know, incredibly... T 
talented writer in John le Carre. I mean, for my money, probably the best writer working in English uh, uh, that's alive today. That's my own feeling about it. Other, you know, everybody else's mileage varies, I'm sure. Raymond Chandler, you know, hard-boiled, you know, very funny, um, former screw, well, sometimes screenwriter as well as, you know, novelist, uh, but, you know, a, a much different type of writer. But between them both, I think that they were great storytellers. I think that they are, in Le Carre's, uh, case of were in the case of Ray Chandler, you know, I think very, very memorable. They have a real style to their writing. And to me, that was one of the most important things. You have to find a voice. You have to find something that's idiosyncratic, both in the writing and the characters and the voice of the novel. And that's why I admire them both. I think they both did that to a very, very high order, but in very, very different genres. The locations in Iron Pilgrim are really far-flung and highly exotic, to say the least. How important do you think is location in novel writing? Very important, especially when you're doing a big international espionage thriller, you know? It's part of the... the, uh, the you know, uh, the, the structure of those books... Um, I was fortunate because I've lived in nearly all of these places. If I haven't lived in them, I've spent a lot of time in them, with two exceptions of Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia, uh, although I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East. So I sort of knew them, and I set a lot of the, the book in places that I had some experience of. Um, but I think from a reader's point of view, to go on that great international cross-continent journey, you know, to go from, you know, Santorini and the Greek islands to into Germany to the Bulgarian border, you know, off to, to you know, the very worst parts of the Middle East. I, I think that's an important element of these types of stories. Um, and it certainly gave it scale. I, I wanted to do an epic story. I wanted to do the biggest, uh, you know, most e emotionally involving, most exciting spy thriller for a generation. And so I felt that it had to jump around the world a lot, and it sure did. <laughs> Still to come. Yes, there is a particular place I, I write from. I go there every morning and I work probably quite set hours really, but I will also work late into the night if I'm completely engaged on a book. I work in silence, in other words, you know, I can't have background music and that sort of thing, which I find very distracting. I have a, a baby daughter who's one, and so I'm trying to work out what my routine is and can be for the next few years. I'm incredibly OCD about knowing exactly what's going to happen in the novel and in every chapter before I write a word. I don't plan anything out. I don't have outlines. I plan out exactly what happens, uh, do scene by scenes, all of that, and then only once I know absolutely what's happening do I start to write. Please keep the conversation going on the website. We really do enjoy hearing what you think about the books we've selected for you. Hi, my name's Terry Hayes and I'm the author of I Am Pilgrim. Yeah, I have a routine. I try to avoid going into the office as much as possible. You know, I clean the swimming pool, look after the plants, do all of that. Finally, I have to go in there and I sit there and I do it until I'm too tired to go on. Um, so there's no strict routine, but I I do work very hard at it, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it, any writer will tell you it's tough. Uh, it's not an easy road to travel. So it's seven days a week, as much time as I can possibly do. It's how I define myself. It's how I understand the world. It's how I interact with the world. I'm a storyteller. I, I can't sit in the car without telling the kids something like interesting I've read or thought about or whatever. So, yeah, I'm definitely driven. My overwhelming sense when I knew it was finished, when I finally wrote, I'd known for a long time what the last words of the book were. When I finally typed them as the, the very last words, he is risen, I just felt an overwhelming sense of exhaustion. I didn't feel any sense of accomplishment or pleasure. I just felt that 
I could sleep for a while. Next time, we revisit an infamous and notorious miscarriage of justice. Big themes, Robert. I mean, in The Ghost, you picked basically what might have happened post-Iraq war to Tony Blair. And the Dreyfus Affair is, is a huge story in, in French history. Why do you pick these big themes? I suppose because I was a political journalist, as you say, and uh, that's my kind of material, really. I've never had a great interest in writing about my adolescence and my, <laughs> my traumas. Um, I'm quite interested in the world and how it ticks and telling stories about mm. it. Robert Harris talks to us about his latest award-winning tome, An Officer and a Spy. Don't miss it. <laughs>